This video may contain offensive language or be frightening to some viewers. Viewer discretion is recommended. A little girl sat in her room. Her messy brown hair was pulled into pigtails, and her hazel eyes stared at the door. She hugged her stuffed giraffe close to her little body and listened closely to the loud yells of her father and mother. I never should have had any damn kids, screamed a loud, deep voice. All they do is make messes, complain, and draw on the walls. He was cut off by the high-angered yells of the girl's mother. They're children, David. They don't know any better. Oh, fuck me, Meredith. I don't want to hear your bullshit excuses. I have had just about enough of them. And what do you plan on doing about it? The girl heard footsteps coming towards her room. She hugged her giraffe closer. The door was violently opened, and there in the hallway stood her large, angry, overweight father. In one of his meaty hands, he held a large textbook. Stop it, David! screamed her mother, but the father ignored his wife's pleas and cries. He grabbed the little girl by the collar, and she screamed and kicked, trembling and shaking with fear. The girl's father harshly held up the textbook. This is for drawing on my fucking walls, you little bitch! Years later, the little girl known as Natalie is now 17 years old. Like usual, she stayed in her room watching TV. Her dad was ranting on and on about some economic crap that she really couldn't care less about while she munched on some popcorn. She was also currently drawing a picture. It had a little bit of gore in it, but she liked drawing blood. It gave her some weird satisfaction. Other than that, multitasking was no problem for her. It became apparent to her at a young age, after having to do so much hard work and labour. She was able to do everything at once. Drawing ended up being her talent and passion. It was her way of escaping from reality. We're here. She looked at a large sign in the school that read, Walkerville Institute of Creative Arts. She sighed tiredly and stepped out, putting her backpack on her shoulder. See ya, she said, closing the car door. She walked into the school and chatted with a couple of friends until she went up to her locker on the third floor. She grabbed her books and, before five minutes was up, she ran to class. Her English teacher annoyingly held out her hand expectantly. Where's your assignment, Miss Ouellette? Natalie swallowed. I, um, I forgot it at home. The teacher growled disapprovingly. Your time is up, Miss Ouellette. Don't disappoint me. Natalie felt puzzled by the thought for a moment. She didn't know why, but those words seemed to melt through her. She simply ignored it and went back to listening to the lesson, dozing off after not too long. Later that day, she was heading back to her locker for fourth period, and suddenly her boyfriend Chris came up to her. Hey... Can... can we talk after school? She smiled lovingly at Chris, though strangely, she didn't expect anything. He was always such a sweet guy. During her French class, she paid little attention, instead doodling things from her imagination. Blood, gore, people being stabbed, and knives. 
Other people say it's pretty dark of her to draw such things. But she saw nothing wrong with it. For a strange reason, it almost felt normal to her. Miss Owelette! She quickly covered her drawings with a piece of paper and looked up at her French teacher. Yes? He gestured her to move her arm with a slight turn of his head. Show me your work. She hesitantly moved her arm and the piece of paper to show the picture of someone being stabbed. The teacher stared, puzzled. She smiled nervously. Erase that and start your work, he said in a calm tone. He walked away as she sighed and erased the picture. And Miss Owelette, she looked up at him. Your time is almost up on getting your work done. I suggest doing it now. She growled at the remark. Time always seems to be against her. As far as she cared, time could go fuck itself. After class, she walked out of the school to find her boyfriend standing near the fence by a sidewalk. She smiled and walked over, hoping her day could at least be cheered up by him. But as she walked over, her smile faded. He wasn't smiling back. Chris? What's wrong? What did you want to talk about? Natalie, I think it's time that we... It's time that we should see other people. She felt her heart break. But why? He gave a stern look. It's your mindset. Your drawings. They creep me out. I think there's something wrong with you. And the saddest part is, you haven't even told me why you're acting like this. It makes me feel like I don't even know you. I just... I just can't do it anymore. I'm sorry. And with that, he began to walk away. Natalie slammed her hands on the bathroom counter at home. She stared at herself in the mirror, eyes twitching. I won't hurt myself like the others. I can stay strong. There was a needle and black thread in her hand. It's pointless. It doesn't help. Some weird sensation pulled at her subconscious. She chuckled slightly. No. I'm doing this because I want to. She held up the needle with thread at the end. She smirked widely. Time is up. Pierce after pierce. Cut after cut. Even though excruciating pain was going through her, she did not whine. She did not whimper. She did not cry. There was no more tears to shed. All she did was smile. The blood from the piercings made a low dripping noise from the sink and onto the counter. When she was finished, she stood back and admired her handiwork. She stroked the horrendous stitches on the side of her mouth that spread into a wide smile. She felt the warm, wet blood on her fingers and licked it gently, consuming the metallic taste of liquid in pure ecstasy. She stopped when she saw her mother's reflection in the mirror behind her, her mother's wide-open eyes and pale face. She suddenly felt the pain and cried, Mum? She had never felt so confused. What had just happened to her? Her mother was worried, and she scheduled some therapy for her. Natalie had gotten rid of the stitches, 
and figured how much pain it would bring, so she went to the therapist. She made sure her hood was up, not to let anyone see. She sat down on the comfortable leather seat and stared at the blonde-haired woman across from her in silence. Your name is Natalie, isn't it? Natalie just nodded. I'm Deborah, and I'm here to help. Now tell me, what have been some of your problems? Natalie stared. Time. Time has been my problem. Deborah had a confused look. What about time? Natalie's hands roughly gripped the leather seat. Everything. It makes you live through it, slowly progressing through life, being controlled by society, only to be tortured. It's a vicious cycle. Time does not end. It doesn't slow down. It doesn't speed up. It's violent, and you live through the torture over and over again unable to fast-forward through it. Natalie had really no idea what she said. She felt it wasn't herself anymore. Could this be because all of the things she kept contained? No. It was impossible, but for some strange reason, she liked it. The therapist leaned closer. Sweetheart, I want you to tell me what happened to you. Natalie still stared. There was a long pause. She smirked slightly, and her piercings from the stitches slightly opened up again. Why don't you tell me, Blondie? You're the expert. Deborah seemed to have an annoyed look. I can't help you until you tell me What's wrong, Natalie? Her fingers started to tear into the leather seats. Natalie isn't here anymore. With that, Deborah's eyes widened. She hastily got up out of her chair. I'll be right back. Please sit here. She walked out, leaving her alone. Natalie did not move. She sat perfectly still. After a while of waiting and impatience, her parents finally walked in. She stood, happy to go, but she noticed her parents' expressions. Even her father had a strange, saddened look on his face. Her confusion grew, but she said no words and followed them to their car. Tired from a long day, Natalie began to drift off on the car drive home. At least, that's where she thought they were going. Strangely, she heard a dark voice speaking in her dream. It almost sounded like herself echoing into eternal darkness. Your time is up. She shot awake. Beads of sweat were rolling down her face. She wasn't home. She wasn't in the car. She was in a bed. A white bed. In a white room. She looked to her side. Seeing that she was hooked up to a heart monitor, she went to get up, but suddenly realised she was bound down. She panicked and began to struggle, but paused when she heard a door to her left open. A man in a white shirt looked at her, his hands behind his back. You must be very confused right now, I can imagine, but I'm letting you know, we're only here to help. Your parents agreed to sign a contract to give you some mental drugs to hopefully help your state of mind. She opened her mouth to protest, 
but was quickly silenced. You'll be back to normal in no time. Just try to relax. He walked over. She tried to move away, but couldn't, due to the bonds around her legs and wrists. He carefully took a mask out and put it over her mouth and nose. She tried to shake it off, but felt herself starting to slip under the drugs, and her eyes slowly shut. Suddenly, she woke up. She couldn't comprehend what the hell she was seeing. She was being given multiple injections, even some things being rubbed on her skin. She felt woozy, but very aware of her surroundings. Her heart rate was starting to speed up on the monitor. The doctors took notice of this, and they looked at her, seeing her open eyes. One of the doctors was yelling at another. She couldn't understand what they were talking about, but suddenly felt a rush of adrenaline shoot through her body, and she began to slip through her bonds, shaking violently. One of the doctors was about to try to hold her down, but suddenly was hesitant to do so. All three of the doctors backed away. She sat on the edge of the bed now, and ripped off the mask from her face and the tube from her arm. She got up, started to stumble, yet caught herself. Her breath hitched, her vision was blurry and suddenly she felt severe pain in her chest. She gripped her chest where her heart should be, then fell to the floor and completely blacked out. She woke slowly. She was back in bed and the doctors sitting beside her. Something went horribly wrong. She didn't know why, but she felt hatred towards the doctor. He took notice of it and looked away. You weren't supposed to wake up while we were giving you the doses. We aren't sure how it affected you, but we have a feeling that we're going to find out. He paused for a second before taking out a small mirror, not looking at her. It happened to have an effect on your appearance as well. She looked at herself in the mirror. Her eyes widened. They were completely green. She noticed that she still had the stitching in her mouth, and for some reason, she couldn't help but feel happy. Her heart rate started to increase again. She gave out a low chuckle. (laughs) The doctor looked in shock, seeing that she was already standing over him. Doctor, she said, still chuckling. He trembled slightly, pressing a button from under the monitor. Yes? Your time is up. A loud scream was heard from the halls of the hospital. Two security guards rushed into the room, kicking down the door. Blood was the first thing they saw. Blood on the walls, bed, floor, and even on the ceiling. Natalie had taken the doctor and strapped him down to the bed. His spine was completely snapped, as the bed had been bent almost into a sandwich. Blood poured from his eyes, nose, mouth, and there in the corner was the murderer. Happily drawing gruesome pictures on the walls in blood, followed by the phrase, your time is up. She slowly turned to look at them, a wide-eyed crazy grin spread across her face. Hello, friends. Would you like to play? The police quickly pulled out their weapons, 
but not quick enough. She was already charging at one with a knife she had grabbed from a table. She slashed it right across the waistline. Blood and organs flooded out and the policeman collapsed to the ground. The other shook his head with fear, slowly backing away, too afraid to even use his weapon. She slowly walked up to him and placed the tip of the knife in his chest. Your time is up. She slowly slid the knife all the way to his gut. His organs spilled out onto the floor, and he collapsed. Natalie's mother was sleeping silently next to her husband. She woke to the sound of knocking on the front door. Annoyed at the fact that someone was knocking at such a late hour, she got up and walked out of her bedroom to go check who was there. It was a cold night, and the rain was pouring down outside. She walked up to the door and paused when she was about to grab the knob. There was a faint sound of <laughs> laughter in the rain. She pressed her ear against the door. Hello, mother. Natalie burst through the door, two knives in hand. Her mother stumbled back, hitting her head against the coat rack. One of the knobs broke into her skull, and it bled violently from the back of her head onto the floor. She had fallen to the ground, stunned but still conscious. Natalie towered over her and slowly knelt down to meet the level of her eyes, and showed her two knives covered in thick red blood. I was suffering, mother. She ran the tip of the knives across her cheek, cutting it slightly. Natalie tilted her head. You were weak. You did nothing. All her mother could do was shake and gasp like a fish on a line. Natalie grabbed her mother and gently set her down. She proceeded to stand on top of her and started to make a V cut into her chest. Her mother only gasped and shook. Natalie knew that she didn't have much time left. She proceeded to forcibly open her mother's chest cavity with a loud crack. Natalie reached inside to grab her mother's heart as it beat slowly in her hand. Its pulses were growing dimmer and dimmer. Suddenly, she ripped it out, blood spurting all over her face. She stared at her mother directly in the eyes as she slowly died. Sweet dreams, she said to her mother's corpse. Your time was up. She put the heart in her mother's mouth, patting her cheeks softly, and stood up. She wasn't done yet. Natalie's father, David, had awoken and realised his wife had not returned. His eyes started to adjust to the darkness of the room, and suddenly realised Natalie was standing by his bedside, smirking crazily with her green eyes glowing in the darkness. Blood was all over her, and the scent was unbearable. She put on a fake sad face. Oh dear, mother's gone. I wonder who will get the money. She suddenly grabbed her father's forehead. That's all you ever cared about, wasn't it? Her father, however, was a fighter. So he sprung up, grabbing her by the neck and threw her to the ground. He started to stomp on her chest until she coughed blood. 
does it feel good, Daddy? She coughed up more blood. After all, you never seemed to mind doing it all those years ago, did you? He narrowed his eyes. You aren't my daughter. A wide smirk spread across her face, and she looked at him with her glowing eyes as blood dripped down her mouth. You're right. I'm not. She suddenly tripped him, causing him to fall hard on the floor. She got up, both knives in hand. They say the bigger you are, the harder you fall. She grabbed a pillow and stuffed it in his face, and she started to stomp on it harder and harder, hearing a loud cracking noise after a while. When she pulled the pillow away, his face was gruesomely mutilated. He was whimpering, crying in pain. What's the matter, Daddy? Pain too much for you? She stabbed both knives into his stomach, leaving them there for now as she ripped off one of the large heavy wooden poles from the bed. She stabbed it down, putting all the weight of her body onto the pole. The pole started to squeeze his insides up to his body. He started to gag and blood poured from his mouth until his breath went silent. With a final push on the pole, suddenly his organs burst out of his body. The nasty gore piled onto the floor and the sides of his face. Your time was up. Finally, this would be her favourite part. She quietly snuck down to her brother's room, silently opening the door with blood dripping from her mouth. Her brother wasn't in bed. It was apparent that he must be hiding someplace. Oh dear brother, she started to walk inside. All I wanted to do was have a little fun. As she stepped further in, she listened closely for any sounds, any breathing. She even sniffed the air for his putrid scent. The closer she listened, she finally noticed something. A faint breathing noise. Whack! She fell to the ground, trembling. Her brother was behind her, with a now bloody baseball bat. He was glaring down with anger, panting in rage. She tried to slowly get back up, but he hit her again. Mother always did like you best. He hit her hard one last time before taking a breather. She was bleeding heavily, her green eyes drooped glowing faintly in the darkness. She felt weak and looked up at the ceiling. She recalled the days that she had spent in here, being tortured, having to go through it for four years. She felt a sudden rush of energy in her body. She started to laugh insanely. <laughs> Her brother went to hit her again, but she used both of her knives to block. You're going to hell, brother. With a strong push, she sent her brother flying over the bed, and he hit his head against the wall. He growled angrily. She got up, and quickly stabbed two of the knives into his arms, keeping him pinned to the wall. He screamed and struggled. Let's see what we could use here. She started walking around the room and smirked, seeing a butter knife on his bedside. She picked it up and walked over to him. They say that the eyes 
are the softest organs in the body. She licked the knife. He looked with horror as she started to dig out his eyes. He shrieked loudly and she quickly tied a cloth around his mouth. Now, now, we can't have the neighbours waking up, can we? He wasn't able to see anything, and the pain was unbearable. Blood leaked violently from his eye sockets. He would cry, but he was now incapable. She picked up a pair of scissors and walked over to him. I think you need to cut loose, brother. She stabbed the scissors into his gut, and he cried out. She treated him like an arts and crafts project, cutting through his skin like paper. She lifted up his large intestines. You know what I love? Macaroni art. She started to cut the intestines into sections. These might be a little too big to fit on one plate, though. She went down to his toes and started cracking them off, one by one. Next, she snapped off his fingers. He was choking on his own blood now. She pulled the cloth down, and blood poured from his mouth. There, there, brother. Maybe this will make you feel better. She stabbed her fingers into his mouth then jammed it into his throat. He choked and died. Your time was up. The girl, known as Natalie, walked into her room. In the corner, she saw the stuffed giraffe. She stared at it, and without a word, she walked into the bathroom. She looked at herself in the mirror, and heard a ticking noise. Looking down, she noticed a pocket watch. She stared at it curiously, before an idea flashed into her mind. She took out one of her knives and grabbed the pocket watch, beginning to dissemble the watch until only the small clock was left. Time makes you live through torture, she said slowly. She began to slowly dig it into her eye, and the vision of her left eye grew blurry and red. Her eye fell into the sink as she tore it. There was a squishing sound until it felt like the clock fit perfectly in her eye socket. I am clockwork. The young girl, who used to be known as Natalie, walked away from her burning house. Inside, the giraffe slowly burned, along with the corpses of her family. Too bad you weren't spending the evening together. That would have made things so much easier, she continued. But good meals often take time and preparation. Wouldn't you agree, Della? Della shrieked in utter panic as Christabel's top canine teeth elongated right before her eyes. Her once icy blue eyes had changed now. They were a deep red, the red of blood. As she struggled to get up, the child let out a ferocious snarl. 